curiosity is not a thing that we have to like teach. Curiosity is innate in us all that the system blocks out of us. Our role is to just like enable it. Hello and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, I interview peak performing innovators in the creative, social impact, and earth conservation spaces who are working to change the world. This episode is brought to you by Brain FM, which combines the best of music and neuroscience to help you relax, focus, meditate, and even sleep. And if you're liking the show, I would love it if you'd buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Isolde T. See the show notes for details. And now, let's get on with the show. Hey there, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. Super honored that you're here. I'm also really honored to have my, I guess, parallel twin on the show today. Check this out. Dr. Kynan Robinson is an award-winning teacher, educational leader, and co-learning innovator. Founder of the, let me, let me just tell you, he and I are working along parallel lines, and I'm ridiculously excited, so you're going to hear me talk about this, and I'm going to get all flustered and, and flabbergasted. He's the founder of the... No, I'm serious. This is bad. Founder of the renowned and Rust Consultancy with offices in the U.S., Australia, and clients on six continents, Robinson and his team are trusted partners of prestigious educational institutions, businesses, and government agencies who are ready to drive the change they want and need. A highly sought-after keynote speaker, Dr. Robinson... I'm going to call him Kynan, has had work published in over 60 academic and non-academic publications. Concurrent with his education career, Robinson is a cross-genre composer and musician, winning three ARIA awards, two Australia Council grants, and a ton more. Kynan, thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so I have many, many questions. Yeah. And I'm going to I'm just going to start with what got you here? What got you to the point where you went, you know what? I need to be working to help people connect through these kinds of creative endeavors. <laughs> what got me here? Mm-hmm. All right. So how many hours have we got for this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> as long as you want. My record is three and a half hours, just so you know. <laughs> hey, like, okay, that's a really great question. And, and I guess, like, I guess it goes all the way back to um, – to, well, well, my, my career started as, as initially as a, as a musician and a composer, and then at mm. some stage, like, um, I met my wife and we had our first child, and she said, "You really need to earn some money." And so then I, <laughs> <laughs> oops, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, and so then I then I moved into education as as a lot of like as a lot of musicians do, and I really quickly, I actually really got in, like I got really passionate about education. I actually loved it. Like I loved the theory behind it. Like um, ru- like um in terms of like understanding how we best learn. And, and so I very quickly moved into sort of um, leadership roles within, within the school that I was in. And one of the, one of the things at the time, this is going back sort of 15, 20 years ago now, technology was really hitting education hard. Like, you know, in terms of everybody had to have electronic whiteboards and laptops and iPads started coming in. And um, part of my role was head of technology. So part of my role in the leadership team was head of technology and, and, um, instead of just like going hard and da- hard down the technology route and, and just flooding the school with technology, I decided to go the other way and sort of stop and go, what does technology enable that has never been enabled before? Um, and if, it's, if there is something there, so like how is it changing the way we learn? If there is something there, we'll go down this route. Otherwise, we're just not going to do it. So mm. which is probably a pretty controversial controversial thing for the head of tech in a school to say let's just not do it <laughs> right <laughs> so my my head of school at the time so I was I was to her, so she 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 was an incredibly supportive woman and she gave me the she gave me the time to actually do this so essentially it took about a year mm. to really start looking at what digital pedagogy actually was like what is it and, and is it in any way different and then when you start really looking at technology, what's the greatest technology that we have? It's language, right? Language is our greatest technology because it's allowing us to communicate. And so the language is essentially changing and, and it was a changing through because of the internet. So then I figured like, okay, so MacBooks aren't that interesting. iPads aren't that interesting. The iPhone's not that interesting. The internet actually is the, the most interesting of all technologies. And mm. what is the internet? This is especially back in those days where it wasn't so controlled as it is now. Um, the interesting about thing about the internet was the 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 
was connectivity essentially and mm -hmm. the way the amount of connectivity a student could have and the um the ability to connect with different connect uh, forms of connection mm -hmm. was the thing that to me that was most fascinating so therefore i started to that's when i started to really move into sort of like network learning theory uh, and then I moved into complexity theory, which is like a theory looking at like complex adaptive systems and how they, how they, what what emerges from them when the right sort of systems are in place. So, so essentially, I, I was what what I was doing was going, you know what, we have the ability right these kids right have the ability right now to connect to networks of knowledge, which all essentially exist on the internet, networks of knowledge. And not only to connect as in a, like, on the outskirts, like sitting way back here looking at them, but they could actively participate in them. And the more you actively participate in a network of knowledge, the more you get to the, closer to the centre of it. So there's a, very, there's a number of ways to actually act, start actively participating. And the more you closer, the closer you get to the centre of this network of knowledge, you're actually participating in the creation of new knowledge. So then I started thinking, so our students could actually be creators of new knowledge rather than sort of passive receivers of outdated content. Wouldn't that be an exciting thing to do? So that's really when I started to move into like understanding how we could potentially change change the way we do education to acknowledge that kind of learning, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So given that, the irony of this is I started looking at out of school learning and in school learning and out of school learning, they're already doing this. Like, you know, they're already through whether they're, you know, they're already connecting to these sort of networks via, and this is going back, remember 15 years ago. So imagine what they're doing now, but I had this great, I had this, I had this great photo of my son, right. Who at the time was about eight years old. And I used to use this photo as a provocation um, when I would do keynotes and he's sitting there on, on our lounge chair and he's connected to the TV. There's a game on the TV, like some, you know, some, uh, an Xbox game, let's just say, or a PlayStation mm -hmm. game. Um, he's also sitting there and he's got two laptops next to him. One is a PC, one is a Mac, right? Then he's also on his phone and then he's also got a pair of headphones on. So wow. there's five, five different forms of connectivity, five obvious forms of connectivity. And I would say to the crowd, um, so what do you notice about this photo? Let's deconstruct this photo. And I would also say, by the way, when I took this photo, I used I, I was the head of tech and this and he was at the school that I was at, by the way, like teaching it. And I would go, this photo stressed me out. So I fully I fully appreciate the whole, you know, I'm stressed out about screen time kind of concept. This one really stressed me out. Mm -hmm. And my wife actually said, why don't you just look at what he's doing? And so that's when I like, even though I talked and talked and talked it, it's still, you know, it still raised some anxiety in me. And so then I deconstructed it for myself and then I'd get the crowd to deconstruct it. And I'd say, what do you think they're doing? The first thing they would always say is, oh, he's multitasking, which is not really that interesting, right? And I go, yeah, okay, he's multitasking, sort of. What else? And they go, oh, he's on both a PC and a Mac. And it's like, yeah, okay, that's not that interesting either, but yep, right, but what else? And they could never get it. And I'd go, what he's actually doing is he is looking for a conversation and he's connecting to at least five or six different networks at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then if you actually notice, so on his MacBook, right, he might have a Google Doc open and he might be creating a story. Uh, on his like you know they're they're all going to different places and if you actually start looking the the information or the connectivity that he's getting from each different network is starting to cross so the the characters in the game are starting to come into his story like it's all started to hybrid and it's all starting to emerge and that's when i start to go wow this is actually really fascinating so he's actually like instead of just sitting there wasting his time on screen like you know screen time or whatever parents would be screaming about he's actually doing something very very interesting now that's his out of school learning like how he learns out of school and then we stick him in school and we take all of that away from him and we go let's teach him about historical famous dates or let's you know like you know classic whatever we do in school nonsense and um that's <laughs> when i start to go oh my goodness there's actually something here which is really fascinating in terms of um terms of how he's learning that that's kind of how it started for me where it goes into creativity is then when you push that we then pushed that into like um, in his school. So and this is a long-winded answer. I'm sorry, but like. No long-winded answers. This is terrific. Keep going. Yeah. 
So then I started going really pushing down this theory of like, okay, this is this is how learning actually happens. It learns through connection. So learning happens through connection. Creativity actually happens through connection. It all, it's all about connection. It's all about connectivity. Learning, how we connect, how we learn, and how we change is all through connectivity. The, the more you increase the connectivity and the type of connectivity, the more it, the more it, it um, influences those other things. So one of the final things I did at that school, which then turned into my PhD dissertation, is we did a, um, I did a project which involved Minecraft, the game Minecraft. Mm, mm-hmm. um, and by this stage, I was really interested in looking at complexity theory. And complexity theory is a theory that says, um, that looks at emergent phenomenon that arises from a complex adapting system, okay, a complex <clears> adapting <throat> system. It looks for the emergent phenomenon that arises from it like magic. Like, So emergent phenomenon is this stuff that comes from the system that that cannot be like it could not be predicted by looking at any of the data in the individual agents that make up the system, right? Mm-hmm. And I went, well, a school is a complex adapting system. It is a complex system. What about if we applied some of the the the, um, the feature sets that allow for emergent phenomenon into a school? So why don't we look at a school and say what enables or what hinders connectivity or what enables or what hinders sort of emergent phenomenon or creativity? rising from a school or or you know what what are the what are the feature sets that do that so one of the things when you look at emergent phenomenon is is hierarchy like the more hierarchy you have the less likelihood emergent phenomenon will Mm. arise the next Mm -hmm. one is is linearity like so if something is very linear it's it's going to hinder like the chances of emergent phenomenon there's other things like uh, communication, internal and external communication for sources etc etc so what I did is I set up a project in the game Minecraft. So Minecraft is a open source game where um, there's really not any rules. Like you can do whatever you like mm-hmm. in there, right? So I, it was the most open world I could find because I was trying <laughs> to I was trying to reduce hierarchy, right? And then we said to the kids, we had 140 kids, of which my son was one. We said, um, you know, these are like 11 and 12 year olds, and we said, okay, our world has blown up because of unsustainable practices. <laughs> However, we have found, we have discovered another world which is remarkably similar to our world, and it's in the game Minecraft. So essentially we're role-playing now, right? We're all flying, and we all did this great, like we did this great simulation where we pretended to get into a rocket and fly to this, this other planet. We are all flying to this other planet, and we are going to build a new world. Or Everything you build in this world will be based on your learnings about sustainability and biospheres, right? Mm. And then what I did was I tried to reduce the hierarchical um, controllers. So who, what are the hierarchical controllers in a school? A teacher, teacher and student. There's your first one, right? So get the teachers out of the way. What's the second one? The curriculum. Get the curriculum out of the way. Like, let's just get it all out of the way and see what happens. And so essentially I'm, I was looking. The, we, we created a complex adaptive system, which is these 146 kids in this game of Minecraft. Um, could they learn beyond what we could teach them essentially and could they create beyond what we could teach them what was the emergent phenomenon that would arise so over a period of 10 weeks they all kind of existed in this world in minecraft and what came from it was truly truly remarkable so it it almost moved into chaos and disaster which is like when you're looking for like emergent phenomenon which like your creativity it said that the complexity theory says you must be sitting on the edge of chaos right? But not falling into it. If you fall into it, you fall into chaos and it's a disaster. But if you go too far the other way, you go into a thing called stasis, which is also a disaster. It's it's like, that's where no creativity happens either. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be sitting right on, right on the edge. This one almost moved into complete chaos because the kids, um, had were not experienced working in this environment and so what they were doing was they were they were sort of like destroying each other's stuff in minecraft it was a complete starting to become a complete disaster but when they would come to the teachers and say oh this is a disaster like can you help our instruction was like no you go figure it out right and so empowering them to do it again empowering them to do it and what they did is they started to apply they actually built and applied a very a very like complex communication system within themselves. Like they split themselves up into like um, five different sort of um, groupings. One was going to be responsible for infrastructure. One was going to be responsible for culture. One, one group was going to be responsible, you know, five different sort of subgroupings within this world. And then anything that had to be built, somebody had to go out and research it and come back and report to the group. And then the group would decide, yes, we're going to build this or not. So the first thing that they decided was, 
okay, we need an energy system in here. So now you can see like the group, because they've put these, these systems into place themselves, they are now starting to hum. They're starting to work, right? It's not, it's not going into chaos. It's going the other way now. Mm. They decided, okay, we need to build an energy source. Like we were an inner city Melbourne school. So like inner city being like hipster kind of a Melbourne school. So like, um, the first, you know, everybody wanted wind farms because it was like, you know, that, that would be the thing to do. Now, this sounds like a cliche, but it's not. We had one student who was, and which is kind of ironic seeing we're in the middle of this like Russian war at the moment, but like there was one student whose parents were Russian scientists and he had immigra- they had immigrated to Australia. And he said, I remember this as a 12-year-old, he said, no, I think we should have nuclear, right, nuclear energy. And he came and said, can I build a nuclear power station to which the teachers who knew nothing about nuclear power said, it's up to you to convince the rest. And so what he did was he then went on, like essentially went on a crusade to teach the whole, all 140 of the kids about what nuclear power was and how to split, what splitting an atom meant. And, you know, he's basically moving down to some fairly complex physics, which nobody in the group, two teachers included, had any awareness or knowledge of prior to this happening, right? Mm. He brought he brought his parents into the in, so they gave us some lectures. He brought in like external resources, et cetera. And so what's that that is an example of emergent phenomenon right there in terms of like the group was starting to teach itself well beyond the capacity of any of the individual of any of the data of the individuals prior to the commencement of the group. And there was there's so many stories and stories and stories and stories of that sort of stuff happening. The group voted him down and we built wind farms. <laughs> <laughs> but the, 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 the actual story in itself is kind of, is kind of interesting. And, and when, when I looked at my data at the end, which is massive, there was so much of that stuff happening where, like, essentially the te- kids were teaching themselves things well beyond. Uh, all the curriculum got covered, by the way, like, all of it got covered, but it went well, well beyond because you'd, I'd, you'd, we'd set up systems to enable or to enable that to happen. So from that, I then went and took all of that and then looked at a school and said, "What is it that enables this kind of, you know, now? Because now what I'm doing is redefining creativity. It's not not as not being an individual experience, but rather it's a collective experience. It's a collective process, right?" It's not an individual experience. Mm-hmm. So when you look at it like that, you can then look at systems like schools or you can look at systems like organisations and go, what have they got within them that either hinder it, like to what feature sets or what structural things that have they got in place that hinder or enable collective creativity and then, you know, do they want that or not? So essentially we're looking at building cultures of innovation. How is that for a really long answer? I love it. I love it. No, this, you, this is catnip to me. So it's so interesting to me the way that you're looking at emerging phenomena and the thing that, that, that popped out at me, and there were many, but one of the things that popped out at me was that like in this, in this nuclear, in the nuclear option, uh, in your example, that student had to believe in his point of view. He had to believe in it. And then he had to be curious enough to go look it up, whether it's to bring in his parents or to do the research himself. And Mm. then the other kids had to evaluate what he did. So can you talk a little bit about that, about how you what your data said and how you managed that? Or did the kids manage it all themselves? Yeah, they managed it all themselves. It was really fascinating. But like, so my role was or our role as teachers. And, and you know, I mean, and then to, to shift the school to this kind of way of thinking takes kind of quite a few years, by the way, to do it. And so like, I've been working sure. in leadership for a few years to train them to train how to think this way, because our schooling system is set up in a reductionist way, which is completely diametrically opposed to this way of thinking, essentially, right. like, um, reductionism sort of um, always drilling down for the answer while this is all, this is like looking for emergent phenomenon. Um, what we did like is we set up um, so so two two data sets we had one was the the Minecraft Minecraft server itself and so in the Minecraft server you can collect a lot of data in terms of what's actually going on what they're building. Secondly, we um, we built a wiki for them and so every child had their own. Um, had their own wiki page like every, every like um every district they called them so the the industrial district or the cultural district had their own had their own page and then running off that that main page sort of like a christmas tree like you know running off that main page every child linked to that district had their own sub pages 
And so all of their learnings were going into a, into the wiki. And so like, like a wiki, like everybody can see everybody else's work mm-hmm. and then everybody can comment into everybody else's work. And then also everybody can actually act, go into everybody else's work and make changes as necessary. So it was applying that kind of way of thinking. And in that, what you're doing there is you're moving away again from like the individual kind of like understanding of learning where teacher stands at front of the class, delivers a whole bunch of outdated, boring content. You're an empty vessel that are meant to just open your neck and get, get this stuff poured down your mm. throat. Mm-hmm. And then your work, which is just like, you know, like, uh, so look at the way they do maths, like, repeating sums over and over and over again for the hope that you'll learn some sort of process or algorithm your work sits in a book right that nobody else sees sometimes the teacher sees it and some to provide feedback sometimes but not at point of need usually it's like two or three weeks after you've written the essay or whatever it is so it's sort of meaningless meaningless feedback but basically it all all just sits in your head in that book so the work that we do now and sort of the work that NRUS does now is encouraging how do we get collective thought out into some form of space where everybody can see it all and then when you do that it can all be shifted around and moved and connected and collected and shaped together and so the collective thought being far more important than any individual thought, if that makes sense. Does that make it, sense? It does. It absolutely does. And it, I, it brings me back to my to my former question about curiosity, because you said yeah. the data can then be looked at in different directions and from different perspectives. But the, the curiosity piece of that has to be there. The kids have to, the students, yeah. the, the employees, the members of whoever, they have to be curious enough about what they have done or what they're trying to do in order to pursue it and then also to to look at it afterwards. Can you talk a little bit about what role curiosity plays in all of this yeah. and, and, and also inquiry? Yeah, great. I love how you threw it into the inquiry uh, word. It plays an enormous role. And um, you know what, like I see like curiosity is not a thing that we have to like teach. Curiosity is in, innate in us all that the system blocks out of us, mm-hmm. right? And so mm-hmm. our role is to just like enable it. Like these kids are naturally curious and as are like if, if, if you know, like if I'm working in a software development company, if I'm working in an organisation, like I am naturally curious about everything. Like, and I think like the older we are, the older we get, we get that more and more like like taken out of us or like reduced from us, or we actually just get it smashed out of us to be, mm. believe it or not. So that so that we think our role, so our role in an organisation becomes like an out you know, output based. Like just do this, do this, do this, and you never really understand why you're doing it. You don't understand how it links to to something broader but when you create a system when you create organizations or teams within um, companies where they can see the impact of what they're doing and how it's impacting something else right they naturally be you are naturally increasing the curiosity that is already there but it has been bashed out of them essentially so curiosity plays a, a, a huge role like in, in in learning if you just go back to kids if you're if, if if you're providing no real world authentic link to the learning, like how can they be curious? Like you're forcing them. It's like the way I was taught about taught maths back in the the bad old days, which still <laughs> exists today. Right. Like where you're just learning a series of like algorithms and you're just repeating them over and over and over again, but you cannot see the link to the real world right and so without the without the link to the real world i am not at all curious about it but if you if you provide that for me like and i always used to think i was dumb and you know i've done five i've got five degrees in the phd and blah, blah blah and i was told i was dumb at school because there was no like there was no um there was no like link, and I'm I'm a very curious human being who is curious Obviously. about everything. But my schooling like really like reduced that out of me, and so like um, you know, and and it made me believe that like that was that was like like not a thing to be valued. Whereas, mm. as you know, and as I know too, you increase curiosity and like, watch what happens, like watch what happens. So you increase curiosity within an organization or with a company and watch what happens in your company. The, the innovation uh, and the self-organization and the meaningfulness of like people finding meaning in their work just 
goes through the roof. And when that happens, you have a company that actually values human beings. It actually values their curiosity. It actually values their creativity. And it doesn't like slam down on them, dependent on what you, the leader, thinks is the most important thing. And your company just grows exponentially. Ah, oh, you're singing my song. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, really, this is... This, your uh, turn. Your exactly. Turn. I'm like, okay, uh, yes. And let's let's just repeat that for the next 15 minutes and we're good to go. <laughs> no, I, I, but, but here's the thing, right? So what that says to me, and this is one of those age-old sort of conundrums that we end up working through and with, mm-hmm. is the leadership of any organization, whether it's a principal or a teacher down into those sort of more microcosm or the leader of a team or the head of a company, they have to change their mindset. I mean, that's why this podcast is called The Innovative Mindset is because they need to change their mindset in order for some of this stuff to flourish, right? You're talking about complex group theory, yay, but that doesn't get to happen unless the leadership of all of these different entities is open-minded enough to go, yeah, yeah, let's try it. So what are your what are your strategies when you walk into a new company or a new school or a new organization? How do you get leadership or administration buy-in for something that is pretty radically different than what they're used to? Great, really great question. And you know what, one of the reasons why I really wanted to come into your podcast is because of the, the title, The Innovative Mindset, and it is all about a mindset. And let me just talk about mindset for a couple of couple of minutes as well. And please pull me back to your question if I go <laughs> off on a tangent, <laughs> because I do have some things I would like to share with, with everybody Absolutely. about how to do it. Um, mindset change is, is super difficult, super, 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 super difficult, right? We have a mindset placed on, on us. Um, for very like you know from a very young age, depending on a, on a variety of things. I personally had a particular reductionist mindset, which is well, like valued binaries like right, wrong, good, bad, this mm. black, white. Um, and so to shift to this way of thinking has taken me like forty odd years of of hard work. Right, it's really hard work to to actually go. No, there's another way of seeing the world. There are other possibilities that you right. are not seeing because of your mindset. So I acknowledge how difficult it is. One of the reasons it's really difficult, especially in the West, is because you have to look at the th- theoretical discourses that drive our thinking, right? Now, this is this might be getting way up there, but this is stuff I love talking about. The theor- theoretical discourse that drives most of Western thinking is a, is, a, is a discourse called reductionism, right? Reductionism, and it drives our education system. It drives how, how our, our, our companies are set up. It drives the military is essentially the most reductionist of all. It drives our med- medical system, drives everything, right? Where it's, it's looking for an answer and it, it says that, that to find the answer, drill down, drill down, drill down, and you will find the answer. There it is right there, okay? Now, this reductionist thinking um, hits us in the age of enlightenment when we essentially start naming and categorizing everything, okay? And, and, I'm, not, and I'm, not, I'm not critiquing it. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. It just is. It just mm-hmm. is, right? Mm-hmm. But it doesn't mean it is, all, it is the only thing. There is complexity as a mindset is another thing that's sweeping through. So when you look at like, uh, and it's causing a lot of tension right now in the West. It's, it's uh, the thing that I think is causing the most amount of tension. And it really is causing a lot of tension in the education system. So complexity is, is the complete opposite, right? Where it is, is doing what I was just talking about before. And you can see in like, um, in um, like sort of, uh, industry like so when we talk about agile ways of thinking or agile approaches to software development right that is drawing from a different mindset okay and so but but not being able to understand the theoretical drives of both of those discourses like you can get very very lost in it and that's why a lot of education educators are lost right now because they go we don't know what to do because like should we like there's all this stuff about pushing towards inquiry but there's this other thing about just pushing towards reading writing and math and like you know like it's that's the clash and so understanding some of that discourse theory is really key it's really key to help people go ah this is what's actually predetermining the way i think now mindset shift when it comes to like how we work right so the way that I'm, the way I'm talking about is like the way of possibility, not predictability, right? And so, to, to, and it's abstract. It is very abstract. I totally acknowledge that. The only way you can learn this, you can't learn this from listening to this podcast, by the way, because it's just abstract concepts that you're hearing right now. The <laughs> only way you can learn this is through experience, right? sure. through experience. And so, um, it's through experience that we learn together. And so, a lot of the work that we do is 
quite often we'll be with an organization and they'll just know that they need to change something and they'll just bring us in and they'll go, why don't we just do three or four days here or there? It's like, okay, let's do that. And so we'll come in and we will give them an experience um, uh, like working in this kind of environment where what will generally happen is they will initially go through a period of ambiguity and confusion. And I'll say that's completely fine. Like it's not, not a bad thing that you're feeling overwhelmed and you know, whatever. Um, and then there will be this point of synthesis, right? So we might run them through a design thinking process because design thinking is it's a good, particularly good process um, in, like to help them shift mindsets because design thinking really values like the collective. It really values like um, it doesn't value the individual and it values like the concepts of creativity coming from the collective. The first part of the first piece of design thinking is what we would call discovery or immersion, right? In discovery and immersion, if we, if we immerse, say, like a school into itself, right, or an organization into itself, all this stuff starts coming out. And if you're, if you're good at facilitating this stuff, right, you are allowing, you've, you've, you've created a non-hierarchical structure within the team that you've put together. So you might have like senior leadership in that team. You might have junior staff. You might have like students. You might have whatever. They're all in this team together, but you've created an environment that's non-hierarchical. Mm -hmm. So all of their voices are valued. Now, it takes a particular skill to do that, right? And it takes... Um, uh, but it is possible. You move really quickly and you do it. And then you start immersing them deeply. And all of this stuff just starts coming out, right? Like, and I say, this is all the problems start coming out. But problems are not a bad thing. Problems being a fantastic thing. Because when we discover a problem, like we have discovered the thing that we can design around, which means we can innovate and change. That's how change happens. So let's let's go and discover the most complex problem that we could find. So my role is to keep keep immersing them, keep immersing them until like, you know, you've got like their collective thinking is all over the walls or it's all over, it's everywhere, right? And this is the point that they are feeling very, very overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. And the, yeah, and, and then, then it's my role or my, my, my team's role to then to know when they, just before they get too overwhelmed to go, now we need to start synthesizing it. And when you synthesize, what you're doing is you're getting them to collectively group and theme. And so you'll move you'll move these sticky notes over there and those over there and those over there, but you, you're teaching them how to do it rather than doing it for them. Right. Mm -hmm. and so in that, but you're teaching them how to do this collectively, which is really, really tricky because people get frustrated and go, why are you moving my stuff? And then like the, the, the role there for my role there is to teach them to disconnect to like the data. It is just data. And it is not your data. It is just our collective data. And let's see if we can start theming. Over a period of time, they'll learn how to do it. And suddenly they start seeing all these themes emerging that they could not see before because they're doing it collectively, right? And then you get them to do it again, get them to do it again, get them to do it again, until finally they've got to this point where it is very, very clear and they go, oh, that's the problem I want to work on. Oh, that's the problem we want to work on as a team. Mm. And we never saw that before, right? And that's the moment, that is the moment where they have had a mindset shift and they now see the world completely differently. And I have had in many, many, many workshops, be that senior board, working with senior boards of major corporations or uh, whoever, it doesn't really matter. Quite often they, they burst into tears in that moment, right? And they go, I now see the world completely differently. Mm. And what they're seeing is the ability to create collectively and work on something collectively. And they're seeing the world from a collective creativity perspective. That's how you achieve mindsets. Yikes. All right. <laughs> wow. You know, and, and yes, I do. I do still want to come back to that original question of how you get the buy-in from the leadership. I do want to I do want to come back to that and we will. But there's something that you said that I really want to touch on and that is to me that that sense of ownership shifting, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The the I this is my perspective, this is my data point. Mm -hmm. What are you messing with it for? And to me when I when I work with my clients, I talk about uh, sort of becoming aware and curious and, and asking the questions like, what is your reason for doing that? Yes. And seeing what those reasons are. When you have that kind of that kind of ownership 
transfer, if you will, transformation maybe from the individual to the collective. What are what are the processes that you see people going through and what results do you see them come to? What ideas do you see them come to once they've done that? Um, yeah, let's deal with the ideas. So the ideas are transformational. Uh, like, and so th- that's really what I'm interested in, transformational change, right? Because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I believe, you know, the values of my company are connect, learn, create change. Connect, like connect. It's all about connectivity. Increase it, the type and the amount of connectivity. Learn. We learn collectively. Create. We create collectively. Change. It all leads to change. These things are not for, they're, they're not for, they're not for individual concepts. They're all interweave, interwoven and they mm-hmm. affect each other, right? Mm-hmm. But change. And then I always say, because you know what change is? It's life. It's called life. It's just called life. And let's have more life. <laughs> for more sure. life, please. Yeah. So transformational change means more life. Um, and so that's the results are they will like the results are when you do this, like, um, and please, I, I've just lost to start your question again. <laughs> <laughs> You're really good at asking these questions that just make me go. Um, but the results are like, so it, the difference between the way our organisation does it and a lot of other organisations, and I anticipate that you do it in a similar way to us, is we 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 won't come in and do the data gathering and data analysis and leave you with a, a big pile of notes saying, here's your problem, here's how you should fix it, right? We come in and do it, we guide you through it. So they are learning this process and they are learning this mindset shift themselves. Mm -hmm. So therefore the problem that they discover, like, and it's my role just to increase the complexity of it. The problem they discover is truly their own. Mm -hmm. And then the solution that they come to is truly their own. And it's truly transformational because it's, it's, it's um, uh, by learning to do it collectively, like the ideas will always be far better than if it was just left up, left up to one person, but also it also acknowledges like, it, like the buy-in is 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 huge because everybody feels equally as part of it and so everybody mm. now really wants to solve this and so if you're mm. looking at product development right or if you're looking at um whatever it is that you're looking at the product that that comes is far more significant it's far more meaningful because this is also not about just connecting in within your team it's also connecting with the uh with the environment that you exist within all right. right. And so, so in doing so, the product that you develop will actually have meaning, will actually have like um, meaningful results within whatever community you're designing for. So that's the result. What was the, what was the first part of the question? <laughs> <laughs> you actually answered both, but, but the, yeah. the, the thing about, the thing about buy-in that, that is, has always made me curious. I, I'm going to tell you a little story. Here we go. Yeah. So Please. I was working, I was working with a school and as part, it was a, a math teacher who had gotten a little grant for me to come in and I we decided that what we were going to do was have the sixth graders design their own sixth grade wing because that's what the school was looking at they were looking at designing a sixth grade wing Mm -hmm. and so we said let's do it so I we the, the students and I we worked out what they would need to know how to do. They would need to know how to do, you know, blueprints and architecture and and looking at the soil and looking at the landscape and looking at the slope of the, the mm. soil and stuff around the school. The kids came up with that. The principal was sort of not really consulted about whether or not we were going to do this. But what happened was he, when he found out, was not thrilled until... He came in when we were doing our field work and we were actually laying out and measuring what the school new wing would look like. And the kids themselves came up with the architectural drawings and the concepts and all of that. And he came outside and he watched them measuring and collaborating and looking at it all together. And then he was thrilled and it's become a yearly project that the school does now. So so the question I have for you about this is that in that situation, we got absolute buy in from the principal but kind of after the fact, yeah. how do you get initial support from from these decision makers when when you're working with a new school or a new school district or a new company or an organization? Do you need to go to them and show them proof in the pudding first? Or do you have some strategies? And if so, what are they? So that if, if, if a leader goes, wait, this might be something I want, how do I even begin to think about it? What do you need to tell them or what do you need to show them? To get that buy-in, that's a really great question. So, uh, what, what, why don't I throw it back on you? Like, why did the principal at that moment when the buy-in happened? Why did the buy-in happen then? 
Oh, because he saw the students engaged and excited and saw the process as it occurred. He saw them being curious. He said he saw them applying these really complicated concepts. And he lo- and by the way, just so you know, uh, some of their designs were submitted as the potential designs for the school. Yeah. And so yeah. that kind of thing had real world results, real world application. And, you know, he ta- he and I talked and he, he was just blown away about how engaged the students were. So he saw it happening. And that is what made it happen for him. There you go. So I think the answer is in, is, is right there. And so you need to involve all stakeholders really early in the process, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. because because what we're talking about is quite abstract result because it, it is going di- it is diametrically opposed to remember like the discourse that you like when you look at discourse theory. So reductionism as being the most powerful. Like if you look at what Foucault would say, Foucault would say like discourse actually predetermines the way we think, act, and do. Right. So it, it, it and, and and it is the case. If you walk into a classroom, I can walk into any classroom and I can tell you from everything that's on that wall exactly what that classroom teacher believes, right, and how that classroom is set out because Mm -hmm. it's been predetermined by the theory that's driving their belief system, right? So so the principle might not even... um, have like unless they, unless they're included early on in the process, they can only believe what they believe, which they believe this X, Y, and Z is how we how we teach and learn. Mm-hmm. And so, if you're if you're moving to like uh, project based learning or cho- voice and choice for students, it's like what is that? That's very abstract for a lot of people until they've experienced it. So, including them as part of the process really on is 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 one of my tricks, so to say. So. Mm-hmm. That, that first, like, you know, quite often when, when I work in a school and if we're working in a school on like strategic projects, right, or strategy, developing strategy, right, I will put a design to get team together that has members of the board, not the whole board, like two or three members of the board, some senior leadership, some senior staff, faculty, some junior, very junior faculty, students and parents, right, So mm-hmm. and, and admins. So you, you're kind of covering everybody, right? And that design team, right, they're, they're there because you're trying to get a representation of the collective experience or the collective thinking, right? But those first few sessions will be <laughs> quite challenging from, 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 a, from the perspective of me as a facilitator or, you know, because they have never experienced this way of working before. So typically, like when you do strategy with a school, right, who does strategy? The board. The board and maybe the very senior leadership. Probably the worst people to do the strategy for the school. Why? Because they don't they, they only know education from the way that they experienced education, which is generally like 40 years ago, right? Right. And so um and and they're they're brought together for like a two-day retreat to do strategy where like all the pressure is on them and they really aren't representing, they're representing a particular way of thinking, but they're not representing actually how education has moved and how can they, right? So when you change it to this this format where their board will be represented, but the pressure is not on them to come up with a strategy, you get uh, you get increased buy-in, you get increased activity, but you also get an increased completion of tasks. So when you look at like the traditional ways of doing strategy, like 20 to 25% of, of, of strategic project um, projects actually get completed and then 75 percent don't in in the normal way of doing strategy and so the normal way of doing strategy is the board do it every three to five years mm. they create the strategy in two days they put together some subcommittees off you go and let's see what happens right so very little get it's very inefficient and it's very very unprogressive when you do this way where they will be represented and they will be consulted so that design team is brought together their role is to I help them immerse themselves into the, themselves and into the school, and then I help I teach them how to do it so they go back to their representative groups and they keep doing it. So the board does get involved, but it gets involved in a much more sort of like appropriate place in ter- mm-hmm. to, instead of a top-down approach. It's like you bring your skills. You're like you, What are your skills? Your skills are meant to be like you've got experience in the real world or whatever it is. Bring those in, but don't bring them in. Don't Don't feel like you have to make the entire decision for the entire school. That's ridiculous. And so, um, so by doing that, you're, you're, you're shifting the mindsets by giving, trying to give everybody an experience at the same time of this new way of thinking and new way of doing in that 
the strategic projects that they will they will land, like the problems that they will discover, which is what strategy is meant to be, will be far more significant and far more real because everybody's like had some sort of voice in it. Um, and then the projects that they design to to overcome those those um, those like even if it's just simple things like increased enrollment, or even if it's things like you know which like COVID has had has had a huge sort of like it's it's COVID has had like one of the things COVID's really shown a light on is the old ways of doing things are, are just gone. Like it's just you can't you know the need for flexibility within education, the need for agility within education is just being screened for at the moment and so the old way is gone and so then what they will design like um, coming out of this process will be far more impactful where everybody feels like they have a role and you know what it really does it actually unites the school it actually brings them together like it does with organizations with all teams it brings them together and everybody finds meaning and everybody finds this is the place that I want to be because I've had a role to play in designing the strategy. I'm taking all of that in for a second. <laughs> yeah, I talk fast, don't I? And I'm uh, no, no, no. Do not never apologize for that. It's just you are you are giving me uh, and and anyone who's listening just a ton to think about. It's interesting you mentioned this notion of, you know, we're we're having to do everything differently because of COVID, because in two weeks, everything shut down a little over two years ago. And how do we do that? How do we navigate that in schools, in organizations, in businesses, in order to maintain some of that collective that you talk mm -hmm. about? What do we need to do? How do we need to design our new community, our new way of, of doing things, whether you're a small company, a large company, a school? And it might be it might all be the same or it might all be different. How do we do that in this new way that we're having to live and work? Yeah, um, we do it like consciously like and But that is a really great question. And so let me talk about like the school, the COVID situation with schools. So prior to working with prior to COVID, like um, we worked with a number of schools here in the States. And one of the problems that came up, which which they could not see previously to our work, was like the disconnection between like stakeholders within the school. Okay, schools are schools are quite isolated places, but they think that they have a sense of community, but they really don't. Mm -hmm. They work in silos, so those silos might be departmental silos, or they might be the silo of teacher student, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, in those silos, like um, with one particular school. I'll, I'll give an example. I won't name the names, but, but whatever. Like um, we, we've done some extensive work and this is a really courageous and brave school and they were really pushing into like, yeah, we're gonna let, we, we want to be innovative. We need to change. What does mm -hmm. that mean? And so they brought us in. One of the problems we found was like all teachers teach, right, um, and because they want a relationship with the students, right? It's, it's key to why you, why, why you take, on to this, uh, take that job on. It's like part of the role. Um, and they all think that they have great relationships. When we went out and actually like tested that, we found the complete opposite was the case in terms of like most of the students were highly stressed. They're all on they're all on anxiety medication. They're all on um, um, you know they fear they want the teachers to like them, but they think the teachers hate them. You know this kind of stuff, which is typical to pretty much every school, right? Wow. It's really it's really revealing to a teacher when they hear that, like, and it can be quite shocking. But it's also like fantastic we have now found something that we can actually fix let's go and fix this what can we design so a bunch of the schools that we were working with were in that place and then COVID hit right so COVID hit and so we put the put the pause on all the work so everybody had to because everyone just got caught in the weeds of like just just surviving which is fair enough um six seven eight months into like the COVID experience a lot of those schools called us back and said hey you know that problem of disconnection it's actually just gotten worse can you come and help because of COVID, right? And so what COVID has been doing is like creating this incredible sense of isolation. Like, mm. and so in the teaching profession or in, in education, like isolationism within like students, it's just it's just increased the gap um, where people are feeling they are working so incredibly hard, but they feel like they're working on their own by themselves and they mm. don't know what to do. They don't know how to reach out. And because schools were not set up for this, right? And so the disconnection is is increasing. Um, and then the second thing that I noticed was this this very negative narrative that was hitting the media, uh, or the media was pushing out that like um, 
Uh, education or schools had failed us over the last two years. No learning had happened and it's all been a great disaster, right? So you can imagine what that's doing to the morale of those working in that sector. That's why sure. people are leaving in droves. So I, we then designed this, designed this um, service, which we called Listen, Learn, Leap. And essentially what we, what we designed it to do was to enable a couple of things. Firstly, to bring people back together and just give them a chance to debrief on the experiences, right? What has actually happened? Secondly, um, to help them spot the innovation that actually has taken place because innovation has taken place everywhere. It's just happening in siloed pockets, right? Like teachers are trying new things all over the place, but they have no chance to sort of share this learning with anyone. Mm -hmm. So to help, help schools spot the innovation and then once you've spotted that innovation, help them unpack it like from maybe from a pedagogical perspective, what does it actually mean that you, what does it actually mean when you used Zoom? What do you like? Don't just tell me that you use Zoom and you liked it or hated it. What about it? Like did it work well or didn't work well for you? And actually some things have come through in terms of like, I never imagined I could do X, Y, Z. So you unpack it and then you help the school scale that across across um, the school. So therefore they are now using the situation for a positive. They have turned it from a negative to a positive and they're using it for to scale innovation and change across the school. This is what we found happened, right? So we put together workshops where we would have faculty and we would have leadership and we'd have students all in the same workshop, right? And we would give them a chance to debrief. Generally, and if you do this, if it's, 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 it's tricky. You've got to be able to do this as a facilitator, but if you have the skills to do it, like what happens is you create a space, which is a sp safe space where they can just talk. Very quickly, um, the teachers would get to this place where they would go, you know, we feel like we have tried our hardest. I've tried everything. I've, I've never worked harder. Um, and I feel like I've failed you as a teacher, right? Very emotional experience. I like to hear that. It's very emotional. And then the students in that, almost always the students go, we feel like we were trying our hardest and we mm. failed you, right? And so suddenly you've got, you've got like a bond happening right there. So what you're doing there is you're essentially creating this environment of collective healing really is what, what's going on where you're trying to show them there is no right or wrong here. We're all doing our best. It's just best. It's just better if we do it together rather than in isolation. In that, they start bonding together as a community. And so then in the spotting of the innovations and the scaling of, scaling of the innovations, what they all, all, they're all craving is community. They actually want their school to be a community. But what you're allowing them to do now is consciously create the community that they want rather than having it created before them, which is what was what's always happened in the past. Like you just believe school is a community, but is it really a community? So now you're actually consciously becoming aware of like, this is what I need from this place. And so it's the same as in workspaces. Why do we go to work? I don't go to work to get a paycheck, you know. We go to work be to connect and consciously create the communities that we want. When you do that, the morale, so the morale in the schools just goes from one of complete negativity to complete re-engagement to where people have rediscovered their passion for why you do this job in the first place, which is about the connectivity. And so when that happens, the learning goes through the roof. If you want to just me measure like how much learning happens from a quantifiable perspective, it goes through the roof because people now are operating on this, like th they feel like they have a voice again. It's a really powerful program that we've got going with schools all around the world. That's amazing. I love it. And I love I love that notion of the community is what is what encourages and empowers the engagement. I think that's it's so yeah, I mean <laughs> I'm a little speechless and I don't, I'm not, it's not, it's my job not to be speechless. So let me bring myself <laughs> up. So, well, I'd like to hear some of your stories. You do this too. Like, like well, well have no. me, have me on your podcast and I'll be delighted to share. No, but <laughs> you know, but, but you know, what's interesting though. And speaking of community to me, community is it's no longer and hasn't been for some time, just a classroom or just no. your local community. It's, it's worldwide. So so, for example, when I when I, I I did for many years, I worked at, for an environmental education program at NASA, and one of the things that I always wanted to do was create collaborations with schools that lived 
uh, completely different parts of the world. A school that lives in Argentina might do a collaboration with a school that lives in uh, in the USA or one that, that is in Melbourne might work with one that is in Cape Town, South Africa, right? So, so, and then they could do the science together, they come up with the research together and they worked on the collaboration together, these students. And so when we're doing that, when we're talking about this notion of community, it's changed. The internet has changed it, but but mm. even your son working with five different ways of connecting, all mm. of that is is it's it's morphing now. It's transforming now into something even bigger. What's your vision for that? What do you imagine? Because I love playing what if and imagine if. What <laughs> what might be happening here, and how how can we best really work with it? To, to make sure that we're moving into the new future in a really creative, community-based way? Uh, my vision is a global mindset shift that embraces complexity and moves from reductionism. <laughs> <laughs> and done. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's, it actually, actually, it is, to be honest with you. And so when you, look at, when you talk about, like, what is creativity, so, like, um, and I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get this into a, like, I've got a book coming out soon and I'm trying to like, just get this into a, a, a way that's sort of like, it's conceptually re really quite difficult, but it's actually conceptually really quite easy. Like, so where, where you, where we embrace the notion of other, right? So like what you were doing there with your NASA stuff, which I find really interesting is like, you're moving it because, because you can, you can move it globally. So you can move it into mm -hmm. the embracing of the other. So the, the notion of, of becoming like, what might it become if we include other, right? Rather than just self all the time. And so then mm -hmm. I talk about like continually becoming other, like, what is that? What does that mean? Like the continual becoming other, which is really about the empathy kind of piece, like developing empathy is really hugely, hugely important important so imagine if we had a world which embraced the concept of empathy not just empathy for like like when i talk about empathy i talk about an, an empathy for like self right like empathy for self to like look at all the things that in me that are actually stopping me hearing you isola because i talk a lot too <laughs> but like <laughs> Um, but, but, you know, hearing other, is really, really difficult. It's actually very, very difficult to do because of the, so that's the mindset stuff. There's so much in us that like, just help, just tells us to keep listening to ourselves, ourselves, ourselves. So helping us helping ourselves develop empathy for ourselves to then develop empathy for other. The more I can understand myself, the more I can understand, I can hear you. And then likewise, if I'm doing that, I'm creating this space where it allows you to do that with me. And in that space, right, in that space, when we're doing that, that's what I call the space to be or the space of becoming. That's where the emergent phenomenon arises. That's where the creative creativity happens. And so, so moving to this mindset of like embracing that rather than this mindset of ownership or mindset of like it's my way or the highway, like mm -hmm. um, that's that's really what I'm trying to push towards, which means, you know, and it, like the age of anxiety, right, like is the age right now. Where does sure. anxiety come from? Anxiety comes from the old way of doing things where it's like self, 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 self compared to what? Self compared to other, self compared to other, self compared to other, rather than like understanding of self to shift self, to connect with other. Like I have no anxiety if like you and me are actually like, like doing that with each other where we're trying to listen and understand each other. And in that, like create something together. That doesn't, that doesn't create anxiety. What it does create anxiety is when I'm competing against you. Right. right. And I'm going, you know, she says that, but she doesn't really know anything about what she's talking about. Like, like watch this. I know like that's creates, who does that create anxiety for you and me? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> for sure. For sure. Absolutely. So moving from that to 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 um, this this new way of thinking for me, all that all that's in there too, in terms of like helping, like it really like like I guess that that's sort of like a a next level up, but like that's that's really also what I'm trying to do as well. Sign me up. I love it. Yeah, you're in. Uh, and, and 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 I really I I really want you to come back when your book comes out and and chat more about this because to me listening listening to you and i'm and i'm thinking about my own work at the same time you know mm. one of the things that i love when it when this happens is it, and one of the reasons i encourage collaborations multiculturally is because it gives you that sense of learning yeah. about the culture that other people have so sorry hold on <coughs> so so learning about each other's cultures and and remove like the way you put it was really interesting about about other to me there is there's nothing wrong with other 
unless we place a value judgment on other being worse or better. Right. Uh, so, so, so that's my, that's, that's the way I approach it. And so when you're talking about these, these communities, the, this, this collaborative connective tissue, almost when we're in this and you're trying to design it for a company, mm-hmm. What is your process of designing it? Or is it in process with the company? Like you, they come to you and they say, hey, this is our need. We figured out our need. We need you to yeah. help us get there. What do you do to help them understand that maybe that, this, that isn't actually their need? Or is that that, that that sort of cultural collective that you were talking about earlier? Because there's been so much. I'm going to have to go back and listen to this episode and really figure out everything. What do what are you doing to design it? Is it in process or do you come in with a design based on having heard what they say? Yeah, like so it, it, that's a really great question. And, and it is a mixture. So it's a mixture of like existing tools and bespoke tools, especially for them. And so or a bespoke process, especially for them. Um, like so when they come to you with a need, I think like the the the, the less listen learn leap stuff that we do, which is the COVID stuff, like can be trans like you can can kind of replicate that over and over again because that's that's essentially trying to do it's it's trying to work the same need, but it's also like we don't assume that like every everybody's experience is, is the same, mm-hmm. and so we don't we don't assume that your experience of COVID is the same as mine, and so therefore this is a one stop fits all like kind of shop. We never kind of do it like that, so when an organization comes to us with a need, like it might be like a need to develop strategy or it might be a need to unpack who they are, like to develop their values, or it might be a need to like, even in schools, like a need to change the way they do curriculum design. Right. We, we have a fairly good understanding of what that means, but at the same time, we are very high touch, which means, um, um, like uh, we'd like to like really get to know the client and so bespoke, especially for them. And so the process there, therefore, and I guess like this is the difference for us is the process is, like I said before, we help them dive into that need, mm-hmm. right? We guide them through that process and then we help them design through a, through a process of design, design the solutions. Okay. So it's not us coming in and doing it to them. We do it with them. I love that. That's Good. yay. Again, your, your, your words are coming out of, no, my words, my thoughts are coming out of your mouth. Yes, yeah. absolutely. So, yeah. so uh, ha- speaking of, speaking of creative and, and inspiration, you, you and I share another, another facet of our lives and that we're both musicians and composers. And I'd yeah. love to pivot just a little bit for <laughs> the last couple of minutes of this and ask it. you, ask you a little bit about that, about your, you, you said earlier on that your wife said, okay, yeah, it's time to make money. You need to do something else, but you're a musician, you're a composer. Can you talk a little bit about being a, a musician, a composer and how that influenced you moving into education? What parts of that did you take into the work you're doing now? Yeah, that's a great question. And I like I really should take that story back about my wife. She really didn't do that to me. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's no one more creative than her and she fully encourages that part of my life. And, and it is it is a hugely important part of my life and, and actually almost like a second career, which I can imagine is the same for you. Um what I did what I took from that is a couple of things. Firstly, like um like so um I, I'm a jazz musician primarily, like mm-hmm. that's how I started. So like I did um, you know, study degree in jazz improvisation jazz music is all about listening like it really really is all about listening and it's about developing your voice but it's it's like you, you develop your voice within context it's always in context and so um a jazz musician who does not listen is like with the worst musician the worst performer on the <laughs> stage they, like they can be blasting away with the most amazing like fast high solos but if it's not connected it's Mm -hmm. it's like they're creating animosity on stage and like then so then that's energy that the the crowd's going to (laughs) going to hear and so they really like it's not so so it's all about learning how to listen which which means it's all about like learning how to um create you know and create collectively like the greatest jazz is like if you look at like miles davis's quintets um you know where it's like um uh, with Herbie and like, you know, that band, it is a collective spontaneous creativity that is happening in real time. And it is about deep, deep, deep listening. And so that's, a, that's essentially the core of what we do is at our work as well, in terms of, you know, those schools that we're talking about, like wh- who are, who are transforming and creating the community they want to create. 
we help them become the listening school to listen to each other. When we listen, rather than telling, we listen. And when we listen, mm. all this stuff comes out. So that's one of the things that really learned how to, uh, that's really helped me. The second one is the ability to self-organize, like so self-organizing teams. So that's essentially what jazz musicians are and like where you can get onto stage. And many, many times in my career, I've walked onto a stage and you're introducing yourself to the other musicians on stage as you're right. about to do the concert. You know, hi, g'day, my name's Kyan. And yep, yep. Uh, <laughs> well, okay, what, what, what are we playing tonight? Okay, it's African music. Okay, okay, off we go. Like, you know, you know, so you, you kind of have a baseline understanding of the genre, but you're really having to create and self-organise on stage very, very quickly. And so mm. jazz music, musicians are particularly good at that. They're also particularly good at, like, just connecting beyond, like, it doesn't really matter if you're a 16-year-old or a 70-year-old, like, we need to connect right now on a stage. And so it moves beyond, you know, you're, you're, the musicians are particularly good at connecting with humanity in that way, which I, which is something I really took. The other thing that I really took is is the composer aspect. When when I started teaching, right, like, as a music, as a music teacher, I decided, you know what, like, these kids get one hour a week of music if they're lucky. Mm. Why the heck would I teach them notation? Like most most music courses are about <laughs> teaching them ta ta ti ti ta quaver quaver you know <laughs> quaver quaver. Like why would I teach them that? So I decided to flip the whole thing and turn it into a compositional class. And so from like uh, and I was working with an elementary school at the time. And so um, essentially, you're what you start you're empowering them to be composers, just like just like most. You know, we value children's children's drawings and children's pictures, but we don't value their musical compositions. Mm. And so I moved it into this place of like just teaching them how to be composers, which means teaching them how to create, how to use their ears and how to put sound together, essentially, is what you're doing, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then what was really interesting is um, there's always this point where they go, you know where they're getting quite sophisticated at it, and they can they can create two they can create two three four part harmony. They can create rhythm parts. They can create you know they they've got it all down. I've never mentioned notation once. There's always this point where they go, "Hey, I really like to um write this down so that we can perform it again maybe tomorrow. I can remember how to do it." And it's like, "Yeah, go 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 write it down. Figure out a system yourself." And then they'll go and try and invent a system of notation. And then they'll always get stumped on something and you can walk over and you can go, why don't you try this? And then you introduce some traditional notation to them, right? Which is like, let's use some quarter notes and some, you know, eighth notes and blah, blah, blah. And they always go, oh, this is awesome. How come nobody's ever thought of this before? <laughs> <laughs> Which is suddenly, suddenly like that the notation has real meaning for them. So it's in time, right? And they have instantly learned, um, traditional notation like they instantly learned it like and if it like it's taken like 10 seconds rather than like the the um laborious sort of lessons they might have got before so in, in doing that like what, <laughs> what i was trying to do for them was like empower them into being like empower their voice and you know what, what i found really interesting after like that that particular program which i, I sort of worked at for about seven years by the by the time like i got to my seventh year the kids who had started as six-year-olds who are now like uh, 12 year olds or 13 year olds right in a 40 minute lesson, they could compose something um, which had like to, uh, a, you know, ABA, maybe like um, so three parts or two parts repeating. It would have rhythmic parts to it, it would have melody, it would have like um, counterpart written into it, et cetera, at a level of sophistication far higher than I could get my university students to compose at which is really mm. fascinating, do you reckon? Because all I had done was empower them from a young age. That's all I'd done, like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. nothing nothing much else. But th that's how fast they could learn, Whether whereas the kids who had gone through a traditional system and then I'd get, hit them at, at university and had to start teaching them composition, it took them so much time to get to that place because they were really intimidated by composition. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Daniel Coyle, I don't know if you've read The Culture Code, he talks in the very beginning of that book all about uh, having – he gave spaghetti, marshmallows, and a couple yeah. of other things to a bunch of kids, like five-year-olds, a bunch of engineers, and a bunch of MBA students. And he said, okay, go. Make the tallest structure you can out of these materials. And inevitably, the kids were the ones who made the tallest structure, in part because they just did, instead of worrying about whether or not yeah. they were going to say the right thing yes. uh, or, or you know, looking at the structural – they just did. They tried. And, and inevitably, he said, two or one – the kids were the ones who ended up with the tall structures. And so one of the things that in listening to what you're saying, I'm, I'm thinking at least some of this is 
they had the need and then that traditional notation became the application that they, mm. you know, became the support system to to their creativity, which I think is wonderful. But some of it is confidence, right? They didn't know not to have confidence in, in their own abilities. Whereas uh, by the time a kid hits university, they might have already lost some of that confidence in their own creativity. What thoughts do you have about maintaining that level of confidence in your own ability to create? A hundred percent, you're a hundred percent spot on. And like, that's what I, when in the early days, that's what I was trying to do. I, I used to use the words demystify the role of the composer. So mm. like only the great, and I, and this is from my personal experience, having gone through it myself. Like I really learned to be a composer later in my life because mm. I was so intimidated by it. Like we could never be a Mozart or a Beethoven, which is all nonsense. Like, um, so, so it was all about that confidence, just giving them that confidence early on. And once they had that confidence, they can just go and do it. And, you know, like it's, it's not only confidence in traditional notation. It's also because like, if you look at most music composition these days, it doesn't require traditional notation. Like, you know, mm. we have moved well beyond composing for the orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. So, so it's just the confidence in their voice. And so, but then let's, let's return to what I talk about in regards to creativity. It's a collective experience, right? So the confidence is finding their way in, in a team to collectively contribute in a meaningful way that's the confidence mm -hmm. so once once again like not thinking my idea i own it i own it i own it so is my eye like and like this is like you know I, I put out an album that's all my my album what do people think about it that's not really what it's about it's like the collective like how do we collectively create which is which mm. is of interest to me and in the collectivity that's when we find our collective confidence and so take that back to the workplace you know organizations that have moved down the path of self-organizing teams right um where where team members feel valued right and meaningfully valued because they are part of a collective creative team that understands its connection to the greater whole and is creating in that way rather than being told what to do which always kills confidence interesting and it, it, what what i what i'm hearing and collect me collect me correct me if i'm wrong is that that connectivity that connection isn't just from the person who might have made it but it also for example in music is also partially the listener what their experience is of 100%. it so yes. so and i and i love that i love that notion uh and and we'll be exploring it further because because as a composer i'm a singer and i'm a guitarist and a violinist and mm. and as a composer some of it is i compose for myself to play some of it is i compose for my my band to play whatever but i cannot do it by myself and so we we keep coming back to this notion of collective mm -hmm. and your your idea is that we all need to be creatively collect uh, one big creative collective which i which i love so let me ask you one last well i have two more questions before we reach the bonus round what yeah. what is your what is your what is your next step what is the next step for you kind and robinson to make this happen <laughs> it's a linear step is it <laughs> oh i you know it can be it can be I'm it can be I'm I'm no 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 it can be but the, but the thing is and and here's the thing for me i everything for me always comes back to mindfulness right so building the awareness for myself that i might want to see a change has yeah. to happen first right so for you there must be a first thing whether that first thing is change the world now or i'm gonna have another cup of coffee what is that next thing for you <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> that question has really thrown me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that was my aim all along. <laughs> I don't think I need another coffee. <laughs> um, the next step, like, yeah. It, <laughs> okay, the next step for us, this is really interesting because my wife just ran me through this process over the weekend to do exactly this. What is that next step? Because uh, my organisation, so NRUSC, we, we work in this area and so – it's the con continually honing. It's the continual honing of our work, who we work with, why we do it, to make sure that we're always pushing towards this value system, right? Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. um, I guess, um, but I don't really want to talk about like what's the next. My wife is actually really pushing the book. My book is actually the next step. To be there you go. With that. Cool. Yeah, that's actually, I'm glad you asked me this question because this is what she's been forcing out of me too. It's in terms <laughs> of like, you need to get this into a into a format that is um 
like understandable. <laughs> well, it, but you know, you know what's really funny about that? It, to, to, I've written six books, and I totally understand where your wife's coming from. But it's not just it's not just understandable. It's quite frankly, much as I would love to have you on the show every day from now until the year twenty thirty, you can't do that, right? You're one you're one yeah. person in in these ideas right now, yeah, yeah, even though you yeah. have a collective that works with you. So to me, getting it in in that kind of format allows more people to get at, have access to your ideas, and that that to me is the value of this: is more people will get to understand your thinking and your processes. So yay! Yeah, and, and I'm I am right in the middle of it, and it is I've got to tell you, it's incredibly. I'm finding it really really difficult. So like, it, it's essentially finished, but then it's like, it's. Like, you know, like just looking at the format, like trying to find the voice in it is, is really challenging. Like, what is the voice? What is my voice here? Because, I, you know, like I've written in very academic voices. I've mm. written in very creative voices. But finding the voice for this is that's my greatest challenge right now. And even if you look at what I've written, like, um, you know, like each chapter almost comes from a different voice, if that makes any sense to you. For like, sure. Sometimes I speak in this route. Like sometimes I write in what I would call very ocker Australian, like, righto, here's how it is. Let me not, <laughs> let me stop beating around the bush. And let me just tell you, this and this is stupid. This is the way to do it, like that, <laughs> that kind of way. And then other, there's, there's other parts which are really like poetic and literal and, I mean, literary and fluid. And it's like, you know, it's like, whoa, where is this writing going? And then there's other parts which are heavily academic. And so that's that's the, my my next challenge is to find a uh, a, conti- a, a consistent voice that goes across this book that helps it reach as many people as as I can get it to yeah I it's I really understand yeah. it it is and it isn't and here's here's why right first yeah. of all uh you talk beautifully so here's here's my suggestion and this is what I suggest to a lot of my clients speak it yeah. speak it right record it voice to text and or read it out loud because that will show you where it is you speaking your voice and yeah, it, great idea. it's really I, I i work with a lot of people teaching them how to do this kind of writing and it is really you will you will know much better when it's you and when it's not you if you yeah. speak it out loud so and it will be very clear immediately and and speak if your wife sounds like she's very uh very much a supporter so see see if you can speak it to her it will oh it will she, she really she is sick of hearing it <laughs> <laughs> well you know what you and i'll you and i'll will get together and you can speak it to me uh but yeah i, I mean there i really want to encourage you to, to think about that because that's one of the best ways to it's really flesh idea. out your voice is to speak it out loud because then it's your you know i've written six books as i said they've all been voiced to text every single one of them has been really? voiced to text yes i that's speak better than i write with my fingers when I, when I try to do it with my fingers what yeah. happens is i start getting very oh i'm going to be very purposeful with what i write i have to choose just the right words yeah yeah which becomes too careful so to get myself to stop being too careful i say it and once i say it then i edit it but it it changes everything and you i have a dear friend who recently passed away but she was at the npr national public radio here in the usa the books editor and that was one of her biggest pieces of advice for everybody is speak your speak your work you will find what works and what doesn't very easily yeah that's a really great piece of advice actually like because when i said like i'm trying to change up change the voice like essentially like what, what what i'm trying to do is take a lot of what was my doctoral thesis and you're trying to like tone it down which is sort mm. of feels like a bit of a slap in the face but it's not it's just like you, there's, there's a particular way of writing for academia which is mm. not appropriate for anything else right, right. and um um and so I did try one chapter. I tried to write in the way that I would speak, but it, it came out as a different character. It didn't come out as me, mm-hmm. which is really interesting. Like, and I think it's in that transfer of into the fingers. Mm-hmm. It, it came out a lot more brutal than what I, it would normally be if I had just said it. Like, <laughs> which, so I really like sure. the idea. I'm yeah, glad yeah. you're welcome to use it. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, you know, it sounds like you and I could spend the next six hours chatting, but I know you have uh, your own life to get back to. So I'm going to ask you before we head to the bonus round in a minute, no, I'm going to ask I'm you. I'm so nervous about this bonus <laughs> round. <laughs> it won't be that bad, I promise. So, but I have one question that I ask everybody who comes on the show. And it's a silly question, but I find that it can get some really profound answers and the question is this if you had an airplane that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see what would you say 
<laughs> Wait, say it again. If I had an air- If you had an airplane that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? Uh, wow. Well, I'd probably just say listen. I love that. Yeah. I love that. The weird thing, be, weird thing about that is you've got this airplane telling you to listen. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true, though. I mean, think about it. Think about think about the notion. Your uh, your point is well taken. Listening is everything. It really is. It leaves you so much opportunity to imagine mm. and to learn and to soak things up and to see things from new perspectives. How can it, how can anything be better than that? I love that. Yeah. Uh, and and, and it, it holds like when I say, listen, it's like there's layers, there's levels of listening, isn't it? And so like mm. just that challenge to, for, for the, for your listener to really go, what is he talking about? Like in terms of really like, like <laughs> deep listening, active sure. listening, but listening with curiosity really is the key. Like yeah, listening absolutely. with curiosity is it's such a wonderful thing to do too. You know what my favorite experience in the world is, is when I, when I, I um, realized that I really don't know very much about anything at all. Like when I discover something new, especially like (laughs) talk about my wife when like, you know, we've been married for 21 years now. And when I find, when I discover something in her, which I'd never known before, like, you know, a trait or like whatever it is. And I go, Oh, I might've got this wrong for 21 years. That's (laughs) for me is such an overwhelmingly pleasurable experience because it's like, that's emergence. Absolutely. No, it's wonderful. My husband and I have been together 30 years this this week, actually. And oh, uh, yeah, thank you. And and it's the same. I'm still learning from him every day. Yeah. And, and it's yeah. lovely. Uh, yeah. And I think that notion of listening, what you were talking about, see, I, I could keep you here for six hours. What you were talking about with, with being, a, you know, being a jazz musician, it's the same thing. It's the same yeah. curious listening to what is everybody else bringing to the table and how does that reflect in what I can bring to the table? And mm. I'm a jazz musician too. And, and it's such a beautiful moment when you, mm. when you're in the pocket with the other Isn't people, it? it's mm. just it, magic. It's magic. You know, For, I've got these stories of like, like very long tours that I've done with bands where like there's one tour where we did 50, 52 European cities in 51 days. So that's wow. like intent. And, and, you know, like when you tour like that, like, um, life can get pretty loose like pretty surreal because you're not living in you're living in an alternative universe essentially mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. essentially like it goes like uh sound check stage after stage signing you know drinking whatever uh, hotel bus do it again every do it all again day. All right and you, and you actually lose context with where you are in the world and quite often it'll be like hey guys are we in italy and it's like no mate that was three weeks ago we're in you know Germany or wherever you are, like you're, right. and all, all you've got is this little group, like you know, five of you plus the tour manager plus the driver. That's it, right? And and then you get on stage and you perform these songs over and over and over and over again. And then I can remember moments where that, uh, like, where you walk on stage and you can be in front of say five thousand people, but really it's just this tight unit, and you are learned you've learned to listen to each other over this period so intensely that the slightest shift, like you're all making very slight shifts now in your musical, in what you're doing, like the way you improvise, or it's just really tiny shifts. And those tiny shifts are just having such an incredible impact that you're in this bubble of energy of creativity on stage. And you're really, you've learned how to listen intensely to each other. And it's an incredible experience, which, which, I um, mean, you know, if people could experience that in all, af- all um, facets of their lives, I guess that's what I've learned from music. I love that. And I love what you'd say about tours and how how you can, you know, there's a flow there, but there's also a sense of of not being quite aware of where you are. Mm-hmm. I how do you what are your what are your touchstones in that way? And and before I before I let you go, I know, see many things. Um, <laughs> because I would love it if if people want to find out more about Enrusk and also about you personally. I'd love to uh, I know people learn differently and all this stuff's going to be in the show notes, but would you mind just going through your socials and also I'd like to talk a little bit about Hotel corridors and what those mean to you. I was wondering if you'd pick that up. Um, well, you brought I mean, up touring, so I had to. You are so funny. You're a great interviewer, by the way. Um, <laughs> Thank you. But so, so like the web, the band, um, my company's website is enrusk.com. So it's fairly simple, enrusk.com. Um, for, for socials, like my name's Kynan Robinson. There's only like two of us in the world. So 
like it's <laughs> definitely if you just type in kind and robinson it's pretty much like um a lot of my a lot of my work will be there whether that be like um you know personal like the music stuff or the whatever it is you can, it's really easy to find but like please do do reach out like and the easiest way to reach out is like um info at nrust.com like i've done a few podcasts where people just go hey you know what like you're so what you're talking about it's really really fascinating and i'd like to just talk about this part a little bit more i'm very happy to get on calls and just talk to people as well and hear their opinions and stuff so do reach out at info at nrust.com um hotel (laughs) okay where this came from um so this is on my personal socials um so my personal instagram which will just be kind of robinson's instagram um and i really need to set it up its own site is like when I when I was touring a lot, so you know, going back over twenty years now, generally I found like what people would do, what musicians tend to do, is they tend to take photos of themselves on stage, right? Because they're trying to connect back to the real world and say this is what I do with my life. But there is somewhere in the world, and so they'll take a photo of themselves on stage. And what they're generally doing is showing off that, like, hey, I'm a cool musician, and look how big the crowd is, right? That's really what's going on a lot of the mm. time. Um, and so I thought I'd go a completely different way with it where I thought like, you know what, the thing about touring is it is so repetitive, right? It is so repetitive, but in that repetition, there is always difference. So I thought I would start by just showing the people that I was the hotel corridor of wherever I was in the world. Right. Mm. And from a hotel corridor, you can tell an awful lot. Like you can actually tell about a lot about the hotel. You can tell a lot about like the level of touring we're doing, <laughs> depending on how nice or how horrible the hotel is. Um, you can, you can just tell an awful lot. And so I just started doing it. And it's also one of those things, like I, I really like art that kind of like repeats. So like, I really like Rothko, like Rothko is a sort of like a repetitive art for like, you know, his art is, essentially the same thing every time but it has completely different a lot of difference and and in doing that like I must have taken now about like 10,000 hotel corridor photos wow which has so it's it's sort of moved from its original intent to like just show people that I was on tour to like um there's something in what I'm trying to do it's it's kind of hard to articulate actually but it is it is also a way of connecting now what what happened from it is i have like people from all over the world who send me hotel corridor photos wow <laughs> quite seriously who like go hey kind and i was thinking of you like you know so they it started off as friends like they're in hotels and so they're having some sort of experience themselves and all they do is they don't they don't send me their tourist shots or whatever they just go hey kind and like normally they wouldn't have even connected with me right uh-huh. but they go hey kind and i was just thinking of you and here's the shot of the hotel corridor I'm in. And so it opens a dialogue of some sort that might not have happened before. And then it's also opened up to like people all over the world who I don't know. Like it has its own sort of sub-community going around it now that of of people who either send it into me. Sometimes I put them up, I put up other people's hotels, but it's just, it's just a way of them connecting and wanting to talk, which is really fascinating. (laughs) I love it. I love it. And it's interesting. I've never thought of putting that, uh, as a as its own thing, but I do I I work a lot of I work in a lot of hotels and I take pictures of sort of my my green room if there is one where where I got ready I will often take pictures of that because it's always interesting the preparation for for before you go on stage is it's a yeah. fascinating process so I I have a lot of appreciation for you doing that that's that's <laughs> fantastic. I am so grateful, Kynan, that you took the time to chat with me. And I know me we're going to come too. back in a second and, and do the, the bonus round of questions. But before we do, is there anything that I haven't asked you that you're like, oh, I wish you'd ask this. Anything you want to close out with? No, because I'm going to have you on our podcast and I'm going to ask all those questions <laughs> of you then. <laughs> I, I, I love just, it. I want to say thanks because, like, I think people like yourself, like, do a really, a, a really valuable service. Some of this stuff can be really contentious and people, like, you know, when you talk in these ways, like, um, especially when we look at, like, like discourse theory, like, people can really rile up and go, what a load of nonsense, and then can really attack. And so the more that we can support each other in, in this way of thinking, I think is super important. I couldn't agree more. And and this is what pushes the boundaries. This is this is what lets us grow and stretch and get curious. And that's, you know, prime directive for me if you're a Star Trek nerd. So uh, <laughs> I am not. <laughs> no. Oh, uh, anyway. So. So, yeah, I mean, because because curiosity to me is is the driving force of so much and and yeah. allows us to really explore. And I think that that's awesome. Once again, this is Kynan Robinson, who has been so kind to come on the show and talk about some of these incredibly fascinating topics. I am Isolde Trachtenberg. I am 
Kramer host. I hope that you enjoyed the show. If you did, do me a favor, let me know, drop a line, see if you have any questions. You can contact Kynan from all of the various places in the show notes. Until next time, this is Isolde Trachtenberg reminding you to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new, and it would mean the world to me if you told a friend about it. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2021. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, remember to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. Thank you.